So let's get started here with uh, diaphragm forces, construction joints, and the dowel design, the transfer. Um, th the title of this is a little, you know, not probably the best title I've ever come up with. There's a couple different things we're going to talk about. One, uh, diaphragm forces, but then most importantly, we're going to talk about the diaphragm transfer uh, and also the transfer of the forces and the levels above um, the question or the design level you're looking at. So if you're in a shear wall and you have five or six levels above, how do we get that load in shear from the levels above to the obviously the wall below through the construction joint? So there's a couple different things that I've seen over the years uh, in doing some peer reviews and plan checks and also just, you know, general engineering practice that uh, I think need to be covered, hopefully, and, you know, make us all a lot more money and help us stay out of uh, – the courtrooms. Uh, in general, uh, and again, this is probably just a me thing, but diaphragms, I think, are as important as anything else, the shear walls, the footings, the moment frames, whatever you want. Uh, lots of books are written about shear walls and moment frames and ductility and hysteretic behavior. And, you know, there's probably more books on base isolation and tune mass dampers than there are on diaphragm designs. But you know, if you don't have a solid diaphragm, not meaning it has to be concrete, but a good design, good construction, uh, you have no lateral system. I don't care how great you detailed uh, your shear walls. They have beautiful boundary elements and wonderful everything else. But if your diaphragm fails, meaning your floor system, um, your whole system is garbage. It means nothing. Not the saying it's not as important or more important than anything else, but it's huge. It's, it's one of the key aspects of your lateral system that until that works, your frame, your brace frame, your wood, shear walls, whatever it is, are effectively irrelevant. And so it's a little surprising, you know, over the years of doing more and more buildings, how the diaphragm design effect, even the analysis, I think is um, – not covered very well in textbooks or academics. It's kind of just brushed off and there's a lot of ambiguity and a lot of differing opinions. Uh, it'd be nice if there was more, you know, kind of appreciation towards the diaphragm. Cause again, it's, you know, a huge part of your lateral system and also it's the floor. So obviously from a vertical standpoint, having that be uh, resilient, tough, redundancy, all that kind of good words, politically correct words, uh, is extremely important to design the structure. Um, as I mentioned before, there are minimal textbook examples on rigid diaphragm analysis in terms of analyzing a diaphragm and then subsequently designing it, especially in concrete. Uh, I know there are some, some examples in wood and uh, some in steel, but in terms of concrete, and especially rigid diaphragm analysis, and then how you detail cords and drags. Um, it's not exactly well documented. I mean, the book that I have written with my business partner has a fairly good example, and I don't. I think that's the only one I've ever seen. There may be others. Uh, I haven't done a huge literature search, but there's not exactly a whole lot of examples on how to do diaphragms, either analysis or designs, which obviously is you know is a subject that should be further developed. Uh, typically for diaphragms. Um, there's not a whole lot of code sections. It's not like beams or two-way slabs and stuff like that. Basically, you have a design for cords, which are your flexure elements in a, like a deep beam analogy, and collectors, which is effectively just shear design. Uh, again, there's not a whole lot of, you know, satisfy this section of ACI, but check this minimum and stuff like that. You're designing an entire plate as one element, so obviously the 0018 or the 0035 minimum requirements don't really apply. So it's kind of in an ambiguous zone of how to design it, but effectively you, you get a moment, you do a TC couple effectively, make sure you have the reinforcement and that the diaphragm is strong enough to take all that load uh, in shear, either in tension or compression, and deliver it to your lateral system. Uh, so relatively simple design philosophy, again, not very code, um, code uh, not a lot of code sections actually satisfy, just something of that shall, this shall work and be properly attached to the walls. So this uh, topic is going to be primarily focused on how we attach the diaphragm, meaning a concrete slab in this particular case, to shear walls or moment frames. Now I will say specifically that I'm going to focus more on uh, shear walls than frames, not because one is more important than the other, but typically with walls, um, the element is a lot shorter. So if you have a 30-foot wall, 
that will not be replaced by a 30 foot frame. It's going to be a probably 90 foot frame or something like that. You're going to have multiple bays to replace a, you know, 18 inch 30 foot wall. So when you have a longer element, meaning a frame, the diaphragm issue becomes less because you're transferring over a much longer space. I mean, if you're transferring over 30 feet versus 100 feet, let's say for conversation, uh, you typically don't have much of an issue over that 100 feet because it's so much longer. Now, the shear walls, because they're short relatively to their length to the diaphragms, their transfer is a lot more, I would say, intensive or critical or detail intensive because you're dealing with a much smaller zone. So the same concept applies, but I'm going to focus more on walls just because of their relative um, short length relative to the structure.